This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Here's something from my childhood. If we could talk to the animals, just imagine it. Chatting with a chimp in chimpanzee. Imagine talking to a tiger, chatting with a cheetah. What a neat achievement it would be. It's from Dr. Doolittle, and I think it's stuck with me. Whenever I'm out doing field work or on a hike, I've not only got my eyes wide open, but my ears too. There's a lot going on in a forest or under the sea, the sounds of nature. And I love tuning into them and wondering. So many of those sounds in nature are about communication, and some species seem more chatty than others. Birds and whales seem to have a lot more to say than maybe a bear or a mountain lion. For me, it's about trying to talk to ravens. My producers think I'm crazy. I do it all the time. I'm just telling him I have to go. He says, are you coming back tomorrow? At at two o'clock, I said. He says, that's too late. How about one? I like to think that we had a lovely conversation. I know I'm fooling myself. But there's something happening that might change that. There's a new tech company out of Silicon Valley that's hoping to make that dream of communicating with animals a reality. Earth Species Project is a non-profit working to develop machine learning that can decode animal language. Basically, artificial intelligence that can speak whale or monkey or perhaps even raven. So we're going to do something a bit different on the wild today. Fun to mix things up now and then. For this episode, I'm not outdoors among the wild creatures, but I'm in my home studio talking with two fascinating people about the latest developments in technology that are being created to talk to wild animals. We'll also explore the ethics of this technology. One of the downsides to playing the role of digital Dr. Doolittle. From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild. With me today is Aza Ruskin. Aza is the co-founder of the Earth Species Project, an open source nonprofit dedicated to translating animal communication. Wow. Uh, He's also the co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology and is the co-host of the podcast, Your Undivided Attention. I love that title. And he was listed on Forbes magazine, I noticed, uh, the 30 under 30 in 2012. Welcome, Aza. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Very excited to be here. Also with us today is Professor Karen Bucker. Karen leads the Smart Earth Project and is a professor at the University of British Columbia, where she's a researcher of digital innovation and environmental governance. She's currently a visiting professor at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. Karen's also the author of the book, The Sounds of Life, How Digital Technology is Bringing Us Closer to the Worlds of Animals and Plants. Welcome, Karen. Very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. It's so good to have you both here. I'm I'm really excited about this conversation with you for lots of different reasons that we'll we'll get into. Um, First of all, before we get going, can I ask this, Aza, when someone asks you what you do, (laughs) what's your short answer? (laughs) That's a great question. The, The short answer is use AI to decode non-human communication, which always gets a little bit of a blank look. And then I'll say, uh, i.e., talking to animals. Although I'll follow that up exactly with, actually it's less about speaking to and more about listening to, developing the AI that lets us understand what whales, dolphins, tool-using crows, what they're saying. 
And I bet that's not the end of the conversation. It's only going to be the beginning with something like that. <laughs> well, I have to be careful if I'm uh, if I'm in a Lyft or an Uber, because if I start that conversation, inevitably, it'll be like 7, 10, 15 minutes late and late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> careful how much you say. How about you, Karen? What's your short answer when someone asks you what you do? So I write about the convergence of digital transformation and environmental change. Both pose existential sort of risks and opportunities for humanity. Within that, one of the most interesting areas is this question of how we could use digital technology to listen in on, to decode the communication of other species. And my work focuses on the conservation applications. We can use this newfound knowledge about the communication of other species to actually mitigate climate change, maybe to slow or even reverse biodiversity loss and even to regenerate ecosystems. Slightly longer elevator ride than Aza's, but uh, <laughs> great teacher. I go right to the top floor, <laughs> penthouse, <laughs> penthouse only. <laughs> So we've kind of split this conversation up a little bit. The first bit is the introduction to all of this for people who don't know anything about it, including myself. Second part of it is going to be uh, delving into sort of the profound questions that come up about the ethics and about the, you know, the possible pitfalls you guys are looking out for and things like that. So we'll, we'll get there. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about animal language or animal communications in this conversation. Karen, how would you describe that to our listeners, animal language or communication? So communication is widespread in nature. And in fact, in nature, silence is an illusion. There's an enormous amount of communication ongoing between animals and insects and plants all the time. Much of it occurs beyond our hearing range in the very high ultrasound or the very low infrasound. So there are a couple of scientific disciplines that study this communication. They're called bioacoustics and ecoacoustics. And what those scientists do is essentially decode the complex information in all of this amazing communication that's ongoing all around us. And the application of digital tech has allowed us to accelerate that agenda, basically a kind of digital doctor Doolittle research agenda. There's a great title, Digital Doctor Doolittle. I'll make a note of that. Aza, how do you define animal language? Hmm. Uh I'll, I'll give listeners maybe a visual image um, that I think will help explain like where we are right now. And that is in 1995, I think it was December 18th, the Hubble telescope pointed, you know, the largest telescope humanity had ever made at that point into a patch of sky that we thought was empty. And, you know, sort of a bold move. And what did we discover? We discovered the most number of galaxies we had ever seen in a little patch of sky. And I think that is the place we are with these digital technologies. We are pointing new tools that go beyond what human beings can sense. And what we're about to discover is that the natural world communicates much more, exactly as Karen was saying, than we ever thought. And so I just want to like expand the aperture for a second for listeners' uh, minds. Before we even get to animals, how about plants? Um, two of my favorite studies came out of University of Tel Aviv. One was um, they asked, well, do you, think, do you think flowers can hear the approach of bees? Nature abhors a vacuum. And so these researchers played different sounds to primrose flowers. They played you know, high-pitched noises like bats. They played low-pitched noises like traffic noise. And then they played pollinator noises. And only when they played the sound of an approaching bee, did a primrose flower get excited? It heard the sound of the approaching bee and it started producing more and sweeter nectar within just a couple of seconds. And actually the same lab then did the inverse and they listened to plants as they stressed them out, in this case, tobacco plants and tomato plants. And it turns out plants emit high-pitched noises, sort of the, the researchers called them screams. And that to me just opens up like the human imaginations like aperture to say there is so much communication we are awash in meanings and signals and what we're going to have to do is use these brand new big telescopes of ai to discover what's been there all along another way to think about that is the um, another optical analogy optics analogy which is the microscope 
So when Van Leeuwenhoek invents the microscope and discovers the worlds of microbes, he actually kept his discoveries secret. He was so afraid of ridicule. Who would have believed that what at the time were called animalcules were widespread everywhere he looked? In well water, in breast milk, you name it. He put a lot of strange substances under his microscope. Now, the analogy today is as we use these new digital tools to listen to sounds in nature, much of which occur beyond our human hearing range, we're discovering all sorts of strange sounds we never even previously suspected. And that is the context in which we are rethinking the definition of language and the extent to which communication occurs across the tree of life. Fascinating. And I love that we've started a conversation about animal communication with plants. Aza, you're the co-founder of Earth Species Project, and you've, you have the goal of, of decoding animal language. What, what got you started on this idea? Hmm. Uh, I remember it was 2013. I was driving down the 280 in the Bay Area, and I heard a researcher, who we now actually work with, Morgan Gustinson, speaking about these these incredible animals, gelata monkeys that live in the Ethiopian highlands. And they have these like, massive manes on their heads. They look sort of like lions, huge fangs, like giant red patch on their chest. And the researchers swear that the animals talk about them behind their back, uh, which is <laughs> probably true. And they, um, you know, they sound sort of like women and children babbling. And what the researchers were saying is that they have one of the largest vocabularies of any primates, except for humans, and I had never even heard of them. And yet they were out there with a hand transcriber um, and and trying to like write down to figure out what the vocabulary was. And that just seemed like a, a, a strange way to do it. Shouldn't we be using microphone arrays and machine learning? And when I looked into it back then, AI couldn't do something like translate a language that didn't already have a translation. It could do something that human beings could do and scale that up, but it couldn't do something that that bold. And that changed in 2017 when there were two papers that came out back to back, October 30th and 31st, which let you translate between human languages without the need for any example. It's sort of like I could look at two different books in languages I don't understand, and just by looking at them, somehow translate between them. It's, it, it's sort of fantastical, but that's what these papers showed how you do by building shapes that represent languages and matching those shapes to shapes. And that was sort of the starting gun for Earth species. Mm. Let's dive a little bit into the mechanics of it. Um, uh, how does this work? How, how, how does a computer learn to speak elephant? So the way that AI was able to translate between human languages is that it asks the computer to build a shape that represents a language. So if you close your eyes and you imagine a galaxy where every star is a word, then in this shape, words that mean similar things are near each other. So, um, and then words, like the one thing you need to understand about AI is that it turns semantic relationships into geometric relationships. So hmm. king is to man as woman is to queen. They share a semantic relationship of sort of regality -ness. So that means in this shape, king is the same distance and direction to man as woman is to queen. So you just do king minus man. That gives you a distance and direction. You add that to woman, it'll equal queen. You add that to boy, it'll equal prince. You add it to girl, it'll equal princess. So you end up with a shape that encodes all the internal relationships between concepts and it actually does this just by looking essentially at co-occurrences, right? Like ice appears next to cold a lot, but next to fashion, not very much. So that gives you a hint that ice and cold are somehow semantically related. And you do this from every concept to every other concept. If you think about dog, dog has a relationship to man, to wolf, to howl, to fur, to cat. It sort of fixes it in a point in space. And if you solve every relationship to every other relationship, that's like solving a massive multidimensional Sudoku puzzle. And out pops a rigid structure that represents all the internal relationships of language. Computer has no idea what anything means. It just knows how they relate. So you build that for English, you build that for Spanish. And the deeply surprising thing was that even though, you know, there are different senses of cosmology, different history, different ways of viewing the world, of relating to each other. And linguists would have said prior to 2017, there's no way these shapes are the same. AI researchers just tried it 
and the shape which is English sort of fits over the shape which is Spanish. You rotate one on top of the other, and while there are words in one that don't exist in the other, if you blur your eyes, they end up being roughly the same shape, and the point which is dog ends up in the same in both. And that's just not true of English and Spanish, but of Esperanto and Finnish and Turkish and Aramaic and Urdu. And pretty much every human language appears to fit into a kind of universal human meaning shape, and dog sort of ends up in roughly the same spot in both. And the way you're doing this kind of translation is by matching like internal structure to internal structure. To me, this is one of the most beautiful and profound results out of AI is that there's a hidden underlying structure that unites us all. Mm, and something that the human brain would never be capable of doing, like a giant language ecosystem upon ecosystem upon ecosystem with billions and billions of variations. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. And the thought mm. is, can we build this kind of shape for animal communication? Some parts are going to overlap for shared experience. Their umwelt, their world experience, the way they perceive the world is so different. There are going to be some parts that don't. Um, so that's sort of like the initial thought for how you might approach this problem. I'm curious, two things. Which animals do you start with? Is it the ones that are chatty? Is it the ones that communicate more? Is it the ones that have greater clarity in communication or that the the human ear can hear? So which ones do you start with? And then can you describe some of the things that you're hearing? Yeah. One of the counterintuitive things about machine learning is that the more information across the more species, across the more languages, each one of those species, each one of those languages is teaching the computer something about all the others. Um, mm. So the way human translation works is you actually just read as much language, both you know translations, but also just text, even without translation across as many different languages as possible. And in so doing, it's learning fundamental patterns about grammar, about syntax, about relationships between things that it makes um, learning a new language much easier. So one of the mm -hmm. ways that Earth species is approaching this is that we're really trying to be a little species agnostic and work across I as see. I many see. species as possible. So don't zoom in on elephants or the more communicative species that we might assume like whales, dolphins, cetaceans, you know. Well, Being broad is what helps build a pattern by the sound of things, right? Is that basically? It, and it's, of course, both. It's both go broad because humpbacks can teach you something about bats can teach you something about orcas, can teach you something about minke whales, can teach you something about the way elephants communicate. Um, mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm. it really helps to get specific about specific species. We're doing a big project right now with Christian Roots on tool using crows, where there are sensors that sit on the crows that record not just audio, but how the crows are moving. Um, and that kind of contextual data also really helps. So it's this interesting mix of both broad and deep at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, Karen, can you relate to some of your work through this, uh, uh, th through the steps that, that Aza is, is discussing here? So one of the amazing things about using AI to decode the language of other species, and I've got language in scare quotes there, um, is that the degree to which acoustic information is encoded into sound conveyed between different organisms is much, much more diverse and far reaching than we had ever thought. I'll give you an example. So we tend as humans to believe that what we cannot perceive does not exist. And because most of the species that are communicating acoustically, we can't hear, we tend to assume they don't make any noise at all and they aren't sensitive to sound. Well, guess what? We were wrong. So let's look at turtles. They're a great example. Jacqueline Giles in Australia went out into the outback of Australia and she spent years recording sounds made by turtles, freshwater turtle species. Her work was the first to demonstrate that turtles, which scientists previously thought were mute, uh, they have a very complex array of vocalizations. They, they whoop, they growl, they scream. You wouldn't believe the richness, but these noises are very quiet. They're very low frequency and turtles are very, very polite. So right now when we're talking, when I finish and you start, there's an interval of about half a second. Birds are the same. Turtles might take up to a minute. So because turtles are so polite, they've got this long turn-taking interval, humans had simply missed the fact that they were communicating at all. 
And what this means is we now can state, and that's in the Sounds of Life, my book, I, I, I build up with the scientific evidence to offer the claim that the ability to hear, to, the ability to detect complex ecological information from sound is probably universal across the tree of life, wow. and it is probably more fundamental than sight. Hmm. So this is uh, overturns a lot of what we had long assumed and is um, somewhat controversial, but there's enough scientific evidence. The book cites over 4,000 papers to make that a fairly robust claim, and that has enormous implications for not only ecology, but for conservation. Because in a world that is this attuned to sound, the vulnerability of other species to noise pollution is profound. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. That's amazing. I think the arrogance of humans stands out from what you're saying. Can we move into some of the practicalities a little bit here, Razor? Can you tell me, for example, uh, how is your team collecting sounds that AI ultimately analyzes? Great question. We uh, have partnerships now with 40 plus biologists, institutions, and labs. And all of our work, no matter how great your AI systems are, if they don't have data, they're useless. Uh, so we get to stand on the shoulders of decades or longer, like sweat, blood, and tears of researchers being out in the field, gathering like the intimate knowledge and recordings of uh, their species, whether it's belugas or whether it's orcas or whether it's elephants. Uh, but they're often siloed. And one of, I think, the big roles that Earth Species gets to take is we get to be the bridge walkers between the AI community, which often gets a lot of funding, but for the human domain, and biology and ecology researchers, which often don't get very much funding, and help bring these tools to the forefront, which helps them do their research for their own conservation. It's really interesting. I have a colleague who's studying the big cats of the world through Panthera, the conservation organization, and they're using visual AI to analyze uh, millions, literally millions of remote camera photographs and videos to detect different species from rare to common and put them, you know, put them into their conservation planning. This is very much sort of the audio version of that, isn't it? These new systems capturing it. And I guess every human, lots of human beings, not every one of them, but lots of human beings have these recording devices in their back pocket these days. That's right. right. So, and I just want to add, it's not just audio. audio is really important but imagine you're trying to decode human beings and you didn't know what they're saying and you just heard this word lunch 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 you'd be like cool so humans say lunch and it's you'd have to know like time like when was that recorded to be like ah lunch is a thing that happens a little bit before noon and then it would be really helpful if you had some video to be like oh it looks like they eat just before they, they say lunch and then a little bit later they're eating I see lunch has something to do with eating. So the work that we do is not just audio, it's multimodal. And your listeners mm -hmm. may be familiar with things like Dolly 2 or Stability, a lot of this new image generation AI. You type in language and out comes an image. And actually behind the scenes, that's using a lot of really similar techniques where you can translate not just from one language to another, but from one modality to another. So you can translate from words into an image or image back to words. And that gives us the ability to start translating from motion, how an animal moves socially into sound, what it says, or what an animal sees in to what it does. And that ability to do a full multimodal system is, I think, one of the big powers of what AI gives. Let me give just one great example of this. Um, researchers have developed an AI that uses computer vision to detect five emotions in mouse faces. Now, the emotions are so subtle that you and I might miss them. It has to do with the positioning of the whiskers, whether the eyebrows draw back and forward, but the AI can detect whether the mouse is, you know, afraid, <laughs> excited, hungry, etc. Imagine combining that computer vision-powered AI with the sort of acoustic pattern recognition that the AI is also capable of, and then you essentially have uh, a reader for non-human communication, a lot of which is going to be non-verbal, especially in species that are not vocally active. So one of the gaps here is species that are not as vocally active. This sort of technology can assist. I've got to say, I mean, just these stories are so compelling. A little bit back to the Dr. Doolittle factor, you know, does this kind of work bring out your inner child, Karen? Is there anything you can tell us about that? 
So in my personal case, I think it's very, very important to ground this sort of work in personal experiences in nature. In the book, The Sounds of Life, I contrast digital listening, which of course is uh, ultimately a digital simulacra of nature sounds, to the practice of deep listening, where, as you know, heading out into nature, digitally unmediated, listening to the sounds of nature in a place where you are relating to other species in a fully embodied way gives gives rise to very transcendent experiences mm-hmm. of, Amen. of interspecies Amen. communication yes. that I have had, you know, living in the beautiful um, Pacific Northwest coast that cannot never ultimately be replaced by digital technology. So my feeling about digital tech is very ambivalent. It is a, a, a very powerful tool that we shouldn't overestimate. I think there's a little bit of hype a- around these tools, but more importantly, it shouldn't ever replace deep listening, unmediated, which gives rise to a sense of attachment, responsibility to place. And that's why in the book, I also emphasize the importance of Indigenous listening and Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous knowledge as a guide. Most of what we are talking about in this program has long been known by Indigenous communities. When scientists say they discover this, as Robin Wall Kimmerer writes in her beautiful book, Braiding Sweetgrass, a lot of this is rediscovery of knowledge that Indigenous communities have long held. And one of the dangers here is that when we go out and harvest all of this environmental data, we are not acknowledging Indigenous ownership of, of the territories, and we're not acknowledging the fact that in many cases um, this, this data harvesting might be inappropriate or should be subject to safeguards created by those Indigenous communities. And there's a big debate about Indigenous data sovereignty that needs to be addressed We tend to assume that environmental data isn't owned by anyone, but in fact, it is owned by Indigenous communities. And so this research using acoustic data has to take this into account, this Indigenous data sovereignty. So these are some incredible ways that scientists and researchers are trying to communicate with wild animals. It's exciting stuff. But... Are there downsides to the application of this technology? I mean, does talking to animals cross any ethical lines? And what could this mean for the future relationship between humans and non-humans? Could communicating with animals help or hinder how humans and wildlife feel about each other? We'll jump into that with Aza Ruskin and Karen Barker in just a moment. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. If we were on a scale of one to ten, ten being being able to have a two-way conversation with a whale or an elephant, which which number are we at? That's a very confusing uh, question, and I'll tell you why. And it's because we are using exponential technology, which means you will overestimate what happens in two years and underestimate mm. what happens in five years. So if I give you a number, which is probably right now like a, a, a three or a four, you're going to project out linearly to be like, okay, so we're like 10, 15 years away, but that's not the case. Um, So there have been a number of papers and techniques out that let you do essentially what ChatGPT does, but for audio. So what does that mean? That means I can take three seconds of anyone's voice, Chris, yours, Karen's, your voice, and with just three seconds of audio, these algorithms can continue speaking in your voice after those three seconds are up. It sounds like you. It's saying something semantically wow. coherent. Scary. As you, it's super <laughs> terrifying and also rad. Welcome to the future. Terrifying and rad. Um, 
Vocal deepfakes <laughs> are around the corner. Totally. Maybe like some... rendering podcasting redundant. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, the okay. idea that somebody could call you up. Now you've really got my attention, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> get 10 seconds of you speaking, hey, who are you? And then use that to call your bank. Like that's stuff we're going to have to deal with as human beings. Um, on the animal front, what does that mean? That means in the next 12 to 48 months, we will be able to build synthetic whales, synthetic tool using crows, um, synthetic belugas that can speak in such a way that they cannot tell that they're not speaking to one of them. Um, so this is the big plot twist, which is, yes, we're going to be able to communicate with animals, but everyone would have said we'd have had to decode first before we get to communicate, but it's the other way around. We are going to be able to communicate before we understand what we're saying. That's where all of these huge responsibilities and ethical dilemmas start showing up because when you invent a new technology, you invent a new responsibility. And before these things get out into the field, we need to show up to those responsibilities. Mm. Karen, um, what do you see as the ethical questions or problems with trying to talk to animals? The ethical questions that arise when we imagine using digital technology to try to talk to animals are really complex. First of all, there's a question about whether those animals and plants <laughs> have given their consent. The sorts of ethical protocols we would apply to humans um, about data privacy and about consent don't usually apply in the non-human realm. And yet, if we were to view them as non-human persons, which some cultures do, and if we were to think about them as uh, having the ability to say yes or no, <laughs> we would approach these conversations in a very different way. Right now, yeah, right now we use digital technology to eavesdrop at scale on all sorts of species. And in the future, it may be possible that we are using these technologies to try to speak back to animals. We certainly already do playback experiments without asking consent. And of course, AI allows us to scale up those interactions. So there is, first of all, this question of protocol. And again, indigenous traditions offer us a very beautiful example and an important example of protocols that are in place when one engages with other non-human persons. Perhaps they could provide um, some important guardrails or insights for the um, protocols we might use to essentially ask permission. We can't always assume other species want to talk to us. The second key point pertains to the potential for harm. So uh, at th we have no way of knowing at the moment whether the um, interspecies communication, the AI generated uh, sounds that we might deploy would be uh, meaningless to other species or meaningful, and if meaningful, would, whether they would be merely, you know, a curiosity, whether they would be helpful and cultivate, you know, a sense of empathy, as you were suggesting, or whether they would actually be harmful. And this is really, really quite worrisome in the context where we now have the ability to use AI to generate sounds that sound convincingly like the sounds of other animals, but we have no idea about their informational content. So it, this could simply land flat, like the animals don't care, they dismiss it, or it, it could actually do a great deal of harm without behavioral observations, without labeled data sets, without giving meaning to these um, large language models or these algorithms that we are deploying. The systems can essentially confabulate or introduce false interpretations and that is actually extremely challenging and perhaps even dangerous. Uh, we wouldn't want to engage in playback experiments where we were actually causing harm without realizing it. And that is indeed possible without guardrails. So that's one very important thing for this research community to, to think about. In a world awash with noise pollution, perhaps the last thing we want to do is be introducing more um, confusing noise um, to, to animals. Yeah. That's a, a very important risk. What you're saying, Karen, reminds me of when we're doing wolf research, sometimes we'll go out to a mountaintop and literally howl for wolves to determine presence or absence of those wolves. And oftentimes they'll respond. And I've had it, I've had the experience many times where the hair is standing up on the back of your neck after you howl for a wolf and you actually get a response from it. It's just the most amazing thing. And every time I do it, I think, but I wonder what I'm actually saying to that wolf. I wonder if I'm disturbing it more than the science is going to benefit those wolves when we analyze this data or figure out what they're doing. 
it's something I think about a lot. And as, as, as humans, we've got a pretty good track record of, of messing things up, even with good intentions. And I have to admit, when I first heard about technology helping us to communicate with wild animals, I thought, wow, cool. <laughs> I've always wanted to be able to do that. I would love to talk to a grizzly bear, you know, my passion species. Mm. Um, then about 30 seconds later, I, I thought, wait, we could really screw wild animals up. It, it seems to me we might just be opening a, a, a giant Pandora's box with this. What would you say, Asa, to that? I love this set of questions. Having now spent a lifetime in technology, I have come to realize that every time you invent a new technology, you invent a new responsibility. So let me give a really specific example from my own life which is I'm the hapless guy that invented infinite scroll, like that thing that keeps you scrolling on Instagram. And when I invented it- Thanks so much, <laughs> thanks so much, Isaiah. You're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're welcome. I, my biggest fear is that I'm gonna get to the end of my life and on my tombstone is going to be, he scrolled. Um, but I think it's a really illustrative example because I invented it because it's actually a better interface. I, I used it for like scrolling on blogs or when you're looking for search results, like scrolling already means uh, show me, I haven't found what I want, show me more. And what I didn't realize is that market forces were going to take that invention, distribute it to 4.6 billion phones uh, in pockets around the world and use not to help people, but to extract time and attention from people. And the realization is that when you create a technology, you your responsibility does not end there. You can't just say we've made a tool, it's up to other people how to use it. You have to think ahead about the markets it'll be used in. You have to think ahead to the regulations, the protections, the guardrails, and the laws that surround that technology. So one of the things that makes me really excited is that you know we have still a couple of years before we gain the ability really to do this kind of two-way communication before we understand what we're saying. And so here it makes me think about how can we bring people together beforehand to create, I don't know, something like a Geneva Convention for cross-species communication and use this moment as everyone comes awake for the possibility to get ahead of it before, you know, um, uh, animal ag and poachers get their hands on this technology and come up with the laws, the regulations, the bindings uh, who can access this technology and have a real deliberative process um, and use the attention to drive through those kinds of um, cultural and uh, social structure changes. And, and is that happening? Is there a Geneva Convention unfolding for AI and the use of it in the animal kingdom? We are at the very beginning of that, but it's something we're thinking a lot about is who are the right people to convene? How do we convene? Um, who are all the stakeholders to have that conversation? But now that the now that we can see a path to this is going to happen, it's exactly the time for us to to begin, and we are. Mm -hmm. The ability to manipulate other species with this technology is profound. It will be possible to use this technology to increase poaching success for endangered species, to engage in precision hunting, and to engage in precision fishing. We could lure every animal on the planet to their deaths with this technology if it develops, as Aza suggests, it might. So this is profoundly important, but the worry is that if we rest our hopes on something like a Geneva Convention, which has been observed um, more in the breach, um, than perfectly observed. And having worked in war zones earlier in my life, I've seen that up close. I think there needs to be not only that regulatory and legal framework, but there also needs to be a protocol amongst researchers, much like we have established for CRISPR. There are certain ways in which the scientific community has committed to not using CRISPR. Uh, and that pertains notably to editing uh, the human genome in certain ways. Um, there needs to be something similar within the scientific community, relying on government to catch up with something like a Geneva Convention, creates too much of a space for harm to be done. So 
What's the upside of that ledger? Karen just very articulately described the downside of it when it comes to poaching and pinpointed fishing practices and whatever it might be that's the the, the outcome of communicating with the natural world. So what is the upside of that ledger? With so many risks, uh, the benefits have to be incalculably huge. What are those benefits to doing this? Yeah, I think the benefits are if you could draw down all the carbon, if humanity could draw down all the carbon in the atmosphere tomorrow, which we should do if we could, that wouldn't fix the core generator problem, which is human ego, right? Like we need to change fundamentally our identity from the post enlightenment, like we have dominion over natural world to we are in relationship and in interdependence with the natural world. So that- From, from, from the triangle to the circle. Right? Yes, to exactly. The triangle where humans are at the top to the circle where we're part of a system, but we're not there yet. So I would argue the technology is probably happening too fast for a society that's not ready for it. No, one could hope that these technologies would foster a sense of communion rather than dominion and a sense of kinship rather than ownership. But in the context of a global economy that is still very focused on resource extraction and a certain approach to animals, both domesticated and wild, I think you're right. I think we're not ready for these technologies. I am reminded of the songs of the humpback whale. Roger and Katie Payne released this incredible album in the end of the 60s where we as a Western society could hear another species sing for the first time, um, or another mammal, I should say. And it had a profound effect, right? Like it was, it went multi-platinum and goes on Voyager 1 as the very first thing on the golden record after human greetings to represent not just humans, but all of Earth. It's played mm -hmm. in front of the general UN assembly and is sort of the galvanizing artifact, which ends up banning deep sea whaling. Like there are times when we get a shift in perspective so arresting it changes our behavior. Think about going to the moon and we, we see earth rise and blue marble, these photos, and they're representative of a mission to get outside of ourselves, take sort of like that earth selfie. And it was when there were human beings standing on the moon that we get the EPA, NOAA, um, the modern environment movement is born, clean air acts is passed. There are times that moments can superpower existing movements um, that really shift entire societies. And I think that's what Earth Species is trying to articulate. The thing we need to be very aware of is, you know, if you think about large language models, GPT, Dolly, you can think of AI really as an emulator. You just feed in data, and no matter what data you give it, it will start to learn how to emulate human thought, uh, human language, it'll emulate images, it'll emulate whatever you give it. And that mm -hmm. means whether we develop it or not, at some point you'll just be able to feed in animal communication and it'll just be able to emulate, that's coming. Mm -hmm. So the question is, knowing that that's coming, not do we race ahead and make the tech and then distribute it, no, it's, how do we show up with responsibility knowing that it's coming, that we can create a moment that shifts the trajectory of how we show up to the responsibility to how to use yeah. it? It's tricky, isn't it? Um, yes, and I, I, I like the Earthrise analogy, but the difference I think these days is that it's a, especially with the subject we're talking about, communicating with the natural world, plants or animals, it's, it's becoming a two-way thing. It's not just receiving the sound of a whale call that, that uh, helped establish the environmental movement and empathy for the natural world, but it's becoming a two-way thing. And uh, wow, you know, you just to boil it down to human terms, you have the wrong human talking to the wrong human and giving them ideas and thoughts. That can be disastrous. So just amplifying that and humans talking to the natural world, it's so tricky, isn't it? Yeah, well, I just want to, like, I think this is sort of like, I think the, the core message is that AI, like I think of it as a telescope or a microscope, but it, last time we got something like this, we looked at it at the universe and we discovered Earth is not the center. With AI, we're gonna be looking at the patterns of the universe and discover that humanity is not the center. And it is that shift that I think we need to see because 
the way we treat animals with asymmetrically powerful AI is going to be the way AI treats us with its asymmetric power. And suddenly we're going to see um, our sort of positionality changing. And so mm -hmm. now is the time we have to understand what is it to act with care and in care. Um, the thing that I am waking up thinking about all the time now is the responsibility. Like in the last year, it's gone from, ah, maybe being able to communicate two-way with animals is like 10 years off to now it's 12 to 48 months off. And that wow. shifts how we have to think about showing up to this. And like, if I'm to zoom out, the biggest problem we face is that our law and our culture and our governance is moving slower than our technology is changing the basis of our law and our governance. And so it's like we're driving a car and mm. that car is going faster and faster and our steering wheel is going slower and slower. And if we don't solve that problem, like then it sort of, it, it slides out for us. What's the famous quote? We have space age technologies, but medieval minds oh yeah and political systems and hence it, therein lies the problem space age technologies and medieval minds i think the way eo wilson says it is we have paleolithic emotions medieval institutions and godlike technology mm -hmm. i would I, I would avoid the term godlike <laughs> but yes more or less i used to know a guy uh, bill hill who worked at microsoft and um scottish guy and quite high up at Microsoft, and, and he would go out and track wildlife and was a, a infatuated with wolves, and he would bring back what he learned from the natural world to the screen, and he was in charge of fonts and screen layouts at Microsoft, and uh, he compared the natural world with the tech world that we've become advanced almost too, that's become almost too quickly advanced for our, our brains, the type of stuff that you're talking about. And he had a great quote in his Scottish accent. He would look at me, he said, after all, Chris, we are only Homo sapiens version 1.0. <laughs> <laughs> we really are, right? Um, one last question. I, I've got to ask you both, what would be the first thing that you would want to say to an elephant, a raven, a bear, chimpanzee, a whale? What, what, anything springs to mind? Is it something you've thought about? It's not the first thing I'd want to say. It's the first thing I'd want to listen for. And that is, you know, humans have been communicating vocally for a hundred to 300,000 years. And whales and dolphins have been communicating vocally, uh, passing down culture, uh, drifting so far that dialects become languages that are mutually unintelligible for 34 million years, right? Think about that, 34 million years. And that which is oldest correlates with that which is wisest. They're not the same, but something has to be pretty wise to survive for millions of years. And whatever it is that is the solution to humanity's problems, it's not currently in our imagination because if it was, we'd have done it. So getting the first peekaboo glimpse of that kind of wisdom which sits outside the sphere of human imagination that i can't wait to get so if i had the opportunity to talk to a wild creature that i love lots of phrases come to mind like i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> i think an apology is in order but beyond that i think there's a question again of whether we have anything interesting to say to other animals miriam Knornschild, who's a wonderful bat researcher in Germany, makes the point, maybe bats don't want to talk to us at all. Maybe, in fact, the most interesting conversations are happening between bats and other bats or between bats and other species. So maybe what we should be asking them is, what are you talking about with that flower or with that other bat? We shouldn't assume we have anything interesting that they would want to hear, but boy, do they have so many interesting things that they're saying that were they to offer could cultivate empathy and could deepen our appreciation, our understanding, our love um, of the natural world and of planet Earth. Wow, so beautiful from both of you. Thank you so much. Aza Raskin is the co-founder for Earth Species Project and the Center for Humane Technology. Karen Barker is a professor at the University of British Columbia and is currently a visiting professor at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. She's also the author of the book, The Sounds of Life, How Digital Technology is Bringing Us Closer to the Worlds of Animals and Plants. You can find links to all of their work in our show notes. Thank you again, both of you. Wow, I will not sleep tonight. 
<laughs> I've got a lot on my mind now. There's so much to process, and I'm really grateful for it. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. The Wild is inspired not just by nature, but by the people who work in it, love it, protect it. Check out our Instagram at The Wild Pod, and you can find me at Chris Morgan Wildlife. The Wild is a production of KURW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producers are Lucy Suchek and Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Paul Lister, Mark Wilkins and Rebecca Badger, Bob Yellowlees, Barbara Stolman, and Annie Mize. Our production team includes Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Michaela Giannotti Boyle, Tatiana Latre, Cara McDermott, Darcy Riggin Schmidt, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm Chris Morgan. If you enjoy The Wild, please spread the word. We tell these stories to reach and inspire as many people as possible. Thanks so much for listening.